Thanks for everyone coming today to another Quarantine Database Talk. Today we have Druba uh, from Rockset. Druba is the CTO and co-founder of Rockset and somebody I've, I've, I've known for, for a while now and they invited me over the summer to give a talk, which was fun. Um, so prior to starting Rockset, he was on the database engineering team at Facebook where he helped work on RocksDB. Um, but I guess maybe his claim to fame when he goes, tries to meet people at bars before the COVID, uh, he would say that he was a founding engineer of HDFS. So whether or not you think that's a good thing, that's you can take that up with him, right? Okay, uh, so with that, we're super happy to have uh, Drew to come give, give a talk with us. And again, the, the way we'll do this is that if you have any questions, unmute yourself and interrupt at any time, but be sure to say who you are, where you're coming from, uh, and then ask your question, okay? All right, Drew, the floor is yours, go for it. So yeah, I'm, thanks for inviting me to present here. Uh, I'm going to talk about real-time indexing on fast queries on some of these large data sets. Uh, just to give a short introduction about myself, uh, I worked, like Andy said, uh, worked a lot on Hadoop file system in the very early days at Yahoo. And I'm also the founding engineer of RocksDB, which I was the first engineer in the RocksDB project building uh, a storage engine at Facebook. Uh, right now, I'm at Rockset um, and building a distributed system for data processing, which is what I'm going to uh, discuss with you folks today. <clears throat> uh, actually, I was at Pittsburgh a um, long, long time back because um, I was working on Andrew file system uh, from Transart Labs. This was like in 1990s. Um, it, it was a spin-off from CMU uh, and uh, I was there for three years. Um, it was good fun building a lot of EFS code which got open source now. So one, one of the uh, one of the co-founders of Transart is his son is, is on the is watching today right now. Oh, awesome. Yes. Cool. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> cool. Okay. So, uh, talk, so overview of the talk again, please feel free to interrupt me whenever you can, and I can help answer your questions. I'll talk a little bit about where Rockset uh, plays into Rockset strengths and then talk about the Rockset architecture and then touch upon three important things that are kind of the unique parts of the Rockset architecture. I'll talk about how we do schema discovery in SQL. Then I'll talk about converged indexing, which is how, what powers our backend. And then I was also talking about cloud scaling architectures and what Rockset does to make this uh, very cloud native and cloud, cloud friendly. <clears throat> so the first um, point is that, uh, or some people that ask me is that, what is unique about Rockset? What is it trying to do different? Or what is the use cases for which Rockset is used for? So um, I've, I've seen the Hadoop uh, ecosystem grow like from day one where a lot of um, batch processing and mostly system optimized for like efficiency. Uh, again, like Andy says, not some code that is like super rock solid, but it was the first system which was where you were able to store petabytes of data, which is why Hadoop became so popular. It's not because it was one of the best pieces of software that we have written. Uh, same thing, uh, essentially maybe with Spark, where there's a lot of stream processing optimized for throughput at even Kafka, I think I'll put it in this middle bucket. So Rockset is mostly focused on uh, analytic, analytical applications, uh, which basically is optimized for three things at the same time. So you can store large data sets. You can also query uh, and expect your queries to be in milliseconds. Uh, and that's query latency. And also about data latency, which is basically the moment your data is produced, how quickly can you make uh, queries on that data? Is it few seconds or is it many minutes or hours? So it's kind of optimized for three different angles. And I'm going to touch in the architecture, how the architecture is built to solve these three cases at the same time. <clears throat> um, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so analytics, again, uh, traditional analytics has been mostly about, um, say, warehouses or things where uh, very standard reporting or some things that you already know what you're looking for. Here, we're trying to do analytics on the fly. Uh, and again, um, it's a system, Rockset is a system which is not a key value store, uh, but it's mostly a SQL system, which means it does aggregations, join, sorts, order buys. And we also want the queries to be fast, which doesn't mean that queries can be many minutes or, or tens of minutes uh, for latency. So basically try to spin up more uh, hardware and then try to reduce the latency of your queries. <clears throat> And then the third is that uh, it's a system which is high QPS, which means that it's, it could be your user-facing analytical database, for example, which is where thousands of queries are coming in at the same time and they're being served 
And this is another difference from traditional uh, OLAP uh, kind of workloads where if you are in a warehouse or something else, it will be a few queries per second, concurrent queries that you might make. <clears throat> so that's kind of the positioning of it. So I wanted to share this because that plays a lot into how the technical aspects are built using these requirements. Um, low data latency, the fourth one, which is essentially, again, um, many systems needs to go through a lot of ETL processes and joining and cleaning before they actually get loaded in a queryable system. For Rockset, uh, we try to do that so that um, you can avoid a lot of these pipelining and ETL processes before you can make it queryable. <clears throat> uh, the focus again is analytical applications, uh, very different from a warehouse reporting kind of uh, workload. So analytical, analytical applications are things like, um, take for example, like you have a fleet management company and your trucks are coming into the loading zone. Uh, somebody needs to look at a lot of data to figure out what things to be loaded in, into the truck. Uh, similarly, say you're an online gaming system and lots of players are playing games and you want to show leaderboards to these gamers. So leaderboards are complex SQL uh, analytical queries that need to look at your most recent data to show you the leaderboards. Uh, just two different examples from two different, completely different uh, industries. So again, a rock set is essentially a real-time indexing database on massive data sets, and it's used for building real-time applications on live data, which is what I mean by not stale data, it's data that's just coming in now, and avoiding ETLs or pipelines. So this one-line summary of what, what the rock set database is essentially designed for. So now let us uh, deep dive to how the design plays a part into solving that use case that I mentioned earlier. So it's an analytical uh, database, which means that there are no transactions, first of all, very clear. There's, this is, Rockset doesn't do any transactions. You cannot do an ACID transaction or a read, modify, write transaction. But what it can do is that it has data which is coming in from streams or data lakes or databases. Databases could be your transactional database or uh, MongoDB or something else, which is your system of record. And you want to get data from all these places and build your analytics engine. So what kind of database would you use to build an analytics engine which can take data from all these places and then serve your queries? So the very um, top level architecture is what we call the aggregator leaf tailor architecture. Uh, what it does is that the tailors are the guys who are tailing data from these data streams. And then it is depositing data into a set of leaf nodes. Leaf nodes are the nodes which actually own this data and crunch this data and make it uh, ready so that queries it can serve queries and then there there's a two-level aggregator which is what is serving all the sql queries that are coming from applications and sometimes live dashboards but mostly applications for us so uh, what is the uniqueness of this so the reason this is very different from a traditional say a lambda architecture or a cop architecture that quite popular nowadays is that this basically follows the CQRS pattern, which basically is that the writes are separated from the reads. Um, because we want data latency to be low, we have to handle bursty traffic, which means the data is coming in at some different volumes of write rates, and we cannot allow it to impact query latencies because it's a user-facing database, and you are expecting, let's say, every query to finish in 500 milliseconds, so you need to finish it. So this is why we follow the CQRS pattern, which is the left side of this vertical line is where the writers happen. And on the right side are all the queries happening. <clears throat> so this architecture is actually what uh, we have inspiration from, from uh, while building the Facebook newsfeed application. So if you all use the Facebook newsfeed, that is an app, that is an analytical app. It is not a transactional app. And it's an app which needs to look at a lot of data and then show you relevance ranking and then finally shows you the news feed. So it uses an aggregator leaf tailor architecture. Again, just for the same reason that query latencies have to be very separate from data latencies and you want to optimize on both. <clears throat> uh, so the tailors are there which basically translates data into like our internal format. Um, and so if there's a lot of high volume of writes, there are more tailors in the system. If the amount of data that you need to store is more, then you need more leaf nodes. And if the queries are more, then you need more aggregators. So it's a completely disaggregated architecture, which is why uh, we can run this efficiently on the cloud system where each of these three tiers 
can scale up and down based on usage. So it's not like tight, tightly coupled system, the very loosely coupled system and we can scale each of these tiers independent of one another. Uh, any questions so far as far as the high level? I'm, I'll deep dive more into this, but any questions from this picture? I mean, this is essentially what Scuba does at Facebook, Memsiegel does the same thing. This is pretty common. Correct, yes, exactly. So Scuba does this, then uh, Facebook Newsfeed does this, then spam detection systems do it because it was very important to detect spam as soon as it is produced. You can't have a data latency of more than, let's say, five seconds. Uh, so yeah, plenty of systems, ad placement systems use this. Um, so yeah, it's quite popular essentially for a lot of web scale companies, I, I believe. LinkedIn also uses the same architecture for the LinkedIn feed, for example. Uh, so that's the high level architecture. So now uh, the benefits again is that we want to make queries fast and more than fast, we want it to be consistent. So the query latencies have to be consistent. And then these queries are very complex in nature. So this is not a key value store. Uh, again, my claim is that key value stores became very popular in the last 10, 12 years. And I mean, I, I wrote a lot of H-based code and other systems as well. But that was because I think um, this is people actually wanted a very fast, consistent query system, which is why key value stores became popular. And if you run SQL systems there, you get very widely varying latencies uh, just because the complexity of the language is so high. So for us, we want to make sure that we can run actually complex queries on the fly and give them consistent latencies. Um, and then uh, we want it to be cost effective so that people can actually run it for large scale data systems for data systems. Uh, and then um, we, like we said, we want to separate the reads and the writes so that bursty traffic does not impact your queries. So the two, this is the only system or like very similar systems I have seen from close at Facebook, but in open source or in commercial, I haven't seen that many where you can do write uh, separation from query separation on a single database. It's not storage separation with compute. It's about write compute versus read compute separation, which is needed for these kind of real time databases in my mind. So how do you do this? Um, so the key design principles that I'm going to talk about is something called, first thing that we're going to talk about is converged indexing, and I'll explain what that is. I'll also talk about smart schemas, which basically says uh, how the SQL engine works for us. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the key architecture uh, reasons why this architecture scales or why this implementation for us scales to high, high data rates. <clears throat> so what is converged indexing? So Rockset, what it does, is that it's a NoSQL database, which means that you can dump JSON, CSV, XML, or any semi-structured data. And what Rockset does is that it builds each of these fields in your data. So no setup needed, no configuration needed. By default, we have made it possible so that you can actually index everything in your data. And what does the indexing mean? It means that it builds a row-based index, just like say Postgres or MongoDB or traditional relational tables that I have built, which is basically the row is the primary key and then I build a row-based index. Given the primary key, I can find all its uh, fields inside a document and their values. I also build a column store uh, index, just like a warehouse, which basically helps in our aggregate queries. And then I also build an inverted index, just like Elasticsearch. So inverted index are really powerful to find uh, like the needle in a haystack kind of queries or queries which have very high selectivity. Um, so all the systems have been in existence earlier. It's not like Rockset invented this, but what Rockset is trying to do is that we have made it really cheap to be able to build all these indices in a single system and on all your fields in your data without having to configure anything. So no need to configure and maintain indices and no slow queries because of missing indices. And I'm going to tell why this is possible now versus why nobody had done this before. So like, um, maybe, maybe you'll get this later, but like, so an, an update comes in through the tailor, you, 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 want, you want to store it. So you store it once, but then you also can index it three times. Do you maintain any consistency across those indexes or does it like, or like, well, like can, it, can it show up in the row index before the, the inverted one? Because the inverted one's great. more expensive. Yeah, great question. So we don't have acid transactions, but do, we do have atomic updates, which means that when you update a document, all the indices are updated atomically. So either you will see the row based index or the column and the inverted index at the same time, or you won't see any of them. 
<clears throat> so it's an atomic right, and I'll explain how we do that actually. But yeah, all the indices show up at the same time. Um, so how does the converge indexing uh, leverage the ALT architecture that you mentioned earlier? So, um, so scaling up tailors is a relatively easy task um, because it's kind of stateless and you can scale up. Scaling up compute is relatively easy compared to scaling up stateful systems. Like all of us know this, right? This is why databases, it's tough to build a database which is very cloud friendly and which automatically responds to your things. Uh, but what is happening is that the tailors are the guys who are actually uh, extracting all the fields inside your semi-structured data. And then uh, it stores the index on the leaf and the aggregators now know which indexes to use to be able to make your queries fast. And I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, take for example, there are two documents coming in with an example here, doc zero and doc one. It has only one field inside the document. Now what Rockset does is that Rockset doesn't store data in, in, in a tradition or just in a, in, in a row-based format or in a column-based format. It actually stores it in three formats. So the R, so basically it shreds the document into key values and it uses open source RocksDB to store this data. And if you look at the right side, this is the data representation. So the R keys are the row keys. So all the keys that start with the R are essentially the row keys where given a document ID and the field, you can go find all its values and you can scan through them and quickly recreate your document that you, that you stored. The C fields are the column store fields, which is basically all the data for a particular column are stored together so that you can do vectorization and other things to scan through all the values. Again, traditional like standard database technology, nothing new invented there, but the fact that we build the columnar store using a key value uh, store and we can actually, and I'll show you how we leverage it when a query comes in. And similarly, all the keys start with S, they're like the inverted index, like what Elastic does. So if somebody is, uh, so in this example, S dot name dot blah dot one, everything is in the key. There's no nothing in the value because it's an inverted index. Uh, so now if take for example, somebody is looking for find me all records where names uh, equal to Dhruba. I am going to go to search for one single key in the database, S dot name dot Dhruba, and then find the doc ID. And then I know which document it is. Like this is this is how Elasticsearch makes their queries fast, right? If you're looking for queries which are very high selectivity, it's like one, maybe one or two lookups into your database that can give you the one or two records you're looking for. <clears throat> um, so now take for example, I'll, I'll do a little bit more complex uh, example here. Here there are two documents, which is more fields than one. The first document has an array, interests is an array, so it's a JSON and we support actually arrays and nested objects because this is our, like, our sweet spot is that people have highly nested documents and we want to index each and every field of this array and of the nested document. So um, there is storage cost associated with it and I'll explain why we can still do it economically for, or feasibly for our users. But the fact that I wanted to show in this picture is that arrays are a first level citizen of this. Similarly, nested objects are a first level citizen of this. So we still built the columnar index, the inverted index and the row index for all the three fields of all the docs in our system. So this is by default. Now what happens is that if a query comes in, uh, well, okay, so I also show you the columnar here. So let's talk about the first, first document has name equal to Igor and the second document has name equal to Dhruba. So now if you see the columnar index, which is the first table on the right side, you can scan through all the names stored inside the name column by just iterating next, next, next over your, over your data space. So it's very easy for us to be able to do say aggregations, max, min, um, some standard deviation or whatever variance you want to calculate across one column, all the values of a single column. <clears throat> uh, so now I'll give an example of two different queries. So this, this query on the left is that we're looking for inside some logs, we're looking for a keyword like say HPTS and locale like N. So there are some filter clauses and there is a where clause. Um, so we know, let's say that based on our statistics, uh, we know that, okay, this is a highly selective query. There are very few records who are, who have, who's going to hit this, uh, these constants. Usually in real 
will have like 20 filters for some complex queries that they run in production. And then we, using all the filters, we can very quickly use the inverted index and give you the results. On the right side are examples of uh, group by, order by, and you want to count or average mean max, then uh, most of the time we default to the columnar store and try to scan and make it as fast as, like let's say you're running it on um, like Redshift or some other warehouses. We'd be at least as fast as those, if not better. Hold up. So let me make sure I understand this. So going back to your example, we, you decomposed it into the, you know, the documents into the three index types. The, the index are just stored in the same, I guess, RocksDB doesn't have tables, right? It's the same table space. Like you're storing that, like you're intermixing the, the, the inverted stuff, the column store, and the row, the row index is all within a single table space of RocksDB. That's or a great you, question. Yes. So, like, uh, let me go back here. This one. Yeah. Right. So the all the keys which are started in R are actually in the are actually representing the rows. All the keys that started C are representing the column storage that we have, and yeah. all the keys that started S are the inverted indices. So yeah, RocksDB has column families, but we don't use it just because it gives us better performance if we do this ourselves. It's one. So, 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 so literally to say, in order for me to do the lookup, say, okay, I need to, I need to do a lookup on the row index. I got to find all the keys that start with the letter R. Exactly. Not all the keys. Yes, but if well, you I mean the one you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you prepend the R automatically. Again, not in your. It, it doesn't show up in your SQL query. I'm talking about the internal implementation. No, I, of course, that's what I mean. So like, it just seems like, is RocksDB really the right thing to, to use for this? Like, it seems like you're, you're leaving a lot of efficiency off, like on the table because you can't do, like RocksDB I think supports page level compression, but you can't get any like the columns for compression benefits. Uh, you're certainly storing the letter, I mean, the, the bit R, or, and it has, it has to be at least a byte over and over again. No, that's a great question. So this is a great question because what happens is that in RocksDB, there is something called Delta encoding already. Okay. Uh, so actually the overhead is like one byte per 4K uh, byte. So okay. it's very less in real life. So it already does Delta encoding for us. Uh, and also there is RocksDB also have things like column families, but we don't use it because there are some other limitations of those of column families in general. So we try to put it inside one table space and it's a general purpose key value store. Yes, I agree. So I think, uh, so I'll show you how we reduce the overhead of some of those things that you mentioned. Okay. But for R or C or S, that is, that is not an overhead, but there are some other overheads that we have to manage more aggressively. Not, not so much also overheads, but I mean, like, I mean, so for, to get the MVP up and running, RocksDB is an excellent choice. Every, you know, this, is, this is the go-to storage. Engine. Like Cockroach uses it, a lot of people are using this. But I feel like that, it's, it's not so much the overheads of, of construing or con contorting RocksDB to, to make it do what you want to do, but like if you built an engine that was specifically designed for a column store index or a vertical index, you certainly would, could do much better. But I understand like that's more engineering work. Yes, and I think uh, what has happened is that um, if you design a column store index, let's say, or a column store database, uh, most people are essentially optimizing for the size of the index because at the end of the day if you're doing a column store you're doing a lot of aggregations mm -hmm. which is why your column store is good right so most databases will optimize how can i reduce the size of this column on disk and in memory so that i can do fast i don't miss cpu caches i can do vast vectorization everything falls in place if you can reduce the size great for column store but what do you do for an inverted index does it elastic or any lucene does that no because it's not very easy but we still yeah. do things we we have Yes, Fano encoding, uh, but it's a different kind of encoding that we use for the inverted index part of this database. You see what I'm saying? So it's not yeah, just yeah, yeah. column store everything. It's different kinds of encoding you use for different pieces of this puzzle, which is what I'm going to explain a little bit in more detail now. Okay, go for it. Um, <clears throat> so if I go back to this example, yeah. Uh, so what are the challenges with this converged indexing? One of them is obviously the disk size, right? Uh, the second one um, essentially is that when a write happens, uh, we don't want, we want consistency of writes, which means that we want atomic writes, uh, which means that if we write one document, we make sure that all the indexes are updated atomically. And how do you do it in a distributed fashion? Because second indexes might be on a different machine in traditional systems, right? 
if you update a record on one machine, but their secondary index uh, field resides on a different machine, now you might need to do a little bit more consensus between those so that they become atomically visible. Um, similarly, if you are doing one field and that if you're updating one record and that record has say 500 fields, now if you want to build 500 indices, your write rate might be very high. So you have to build a system so that you can support that kind of indexing. Um, is my thing making sense? Uh, basically, yeah, indexing is a problem when you have say a thousand fields in a in a in a in a in a record, and you say, "Hey, I'm going to create an index on every thousand field." Our databases have this uh, command called create index. Uh, Rockset has nothing. Rockset doesn't have a create index. It says, "I can make this command obsolete," and databases don't need this create index field anymore or command anymore. How do you do it? Um, so in traditional databases, again, sharding. Mm, let's say this is a document coming in. Um, again, I took a simple example in this case, uh, but if we want to build all the different indices together, let's, let's say a columnar index, an inverted index, and a record store index, and they reside on three different systems or three different machines, then I need to do a, a kind of a, um, more like a consensus protocol so that I can make sure that these three updates on three different machines are visible at the same time, right? Um, what is, what Rockset does, is that it doesn't use term sharding. Uh, so Rockset uses something called doc sharding, which means that the entire doc is stored on a machine. So all the indices for the doc are actually stored on the machine. So this is very similar to how search systems work. Um, search systems, like if you look at Google search or like even Facebook search that we built, they're all built uh, where entire documents and their indices reside on one machine. And um, what we do is that when, when writes come in, um, they actually get piped through a distributed log. And the distributed log uh, is kind of sharded among all the machines based on some keys or basically, let's say, the doc ID of the, of the document. And all the indices of the document are local to one machine. So the secondary indices don't, don't need Paxos or Raft or anything else. It's all local to one machine. So if we have to build a thousand indices on one record, on one document that's coming in, all the thousand indices will be on one machine. Yes, makes sense. On the other hand, the disadvantage is that when a query comes in, now you need the query need to fan out to all the machines in your database and get results. So this is the, basically the difference between traditional systems that I, I have built and I've read like a, HBase is one system that I'm pretty hands-on with. Uh, similarly, Cassandra or anything else that you have where most of the databases in my mind are, uh, are optimized for like throughput and efficiency, not for latency. And search systems are optimized for latency, Google search or Facebook search. And here the focus is how can I use a search architecture and build a database so that you're, it's focused on optimizing or reducing your latency which is why when a query comes in, it needs to fan out, let's say there are 100 machines in our cluster, it needs to fan out to all the 100 machines in our cluster. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages of sharding. One is that you know, if one machine is slow, then you could have some trouble in making sure your query latencies are still good, right? Because you have to hit all 100 machines in your cluster. The other, the, there's an advantage though, is that if there's complex SQL queries, you get to use the CPU of all the 100 machines to run that SQL query in parallel on small sets of your data. So this is why the latency is really small compared to traditional databases or database sharding, I should say, if you do doc sharding. So another system that does doc sharding, another open source that does doc sharding is Elasticsearch, which is why the query latency is very low. Uh, but none of the traditional open source databases do dog sharding at all. They all do term sharding and are optimized for throughput and efficiency, not for latency. So this is one thing that Rox Rockset does, which is basically everything is dog sharded. Uh, another simple example to explain dog sharding is like databases, if you have two different um, fields in your record, or like let's say one has different data, other field has review data, you would probably try to do term partitioning and put them in different places so that they can do to efficient queries on uh, on fields that you're interested in. Whereas in Rockset, everything is uniform among all the machines 
And so right at the time of write, you go to um, any machine and, and then queries need to hit all the machines in your cluster and give you a So just different hiding architectures for Rockset versus many other databases familiar with. Any questions so far? Okay, and the second one, I think that is also a challenge is that uh, how can I build an index on a record which has thousand fields in every record? So like if you're using a B-tree based system, I think that's quite complicated. I mean, this is probably known to all of us here in the database community uh, uh, because we don't want to update thousand B-tree leaf pages uh, when an update happens. Otherwise, there will all be thousand writes onto the storage system. So Rockset does is obviously by using the RocksDB LSM, uh, which is what we get for free is that when data comes in, we write it to memory buffer in the log structured merge tree. Uh, and then uh, even though the record has thousand fields, there are not thousand writes to the storage system. There is one single write because RocksDB does a good job prioritizing all the writes, all the random writes into making it sequential writes on storage. So the memory buffer gets full and then gets written to an SSD file on storage and then there's background compaction. So just by leveraging RocksDB LSM, we can uh, handle sparse fields and we can handle thousands of fields in a record and continue to index them without having this random write problem that uh, other systems might have. Any questions so far on this? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So the second part, so that is conversion indexing. That's how we maintain the storage system that is, that is there, now, right? Now the question is about how to make SQL queries on it because what Rockset has, it's JSON data but SQL queries on the other side. Uh, there's nothing in the middle that a user has to do. Uh, so what happens is that we automatically generate a schema based on the exact fields that are present at the time of ingest. Uh, what it, I, I will show you a pictorial description about what it means, but I'll give you a second to read this line. What it means is that it's not schema free or schema less, but the schema is deduced based on the, when you make the query, we look at all the data in your system at that time when you make the query and say that, okay, these are the, this is what your schema is currently. It has 500 columns of your, your table is 500 columns and the types of these are these. So how do you do this? <clears throat> uh, this is semi-structured data that is coming in, no SQL data that is coming in. And I'll show you this picture. So let's say there are these two records coming in on the top, right? There are two JSON. One has age is 31. The other one is, let's say, age is a string or some other thing because, I mean, in no SQL world, this is very common. Some guys refuse, like, there is no fixed schema. There is going to be variable things. People might make mistakes in generating this data, right? So when we come in and we, we index uh, all these records and all these fields in these records and the type of each field. So we also index the type. <clears throat> and what Rockset is different from the systems is that typically in most relational databases, the type is associated with the column, right? Let's say the column name is age and the type is an integer. That will be how you can create a SQL schema out of it. For us, we associate the type with every value inside the column. So the type is not associated with the entire column. It's associated with every value inside the column and we store it efficiently. So in this example, you can see that, hey, look, age is one, 50% of ages have strings and 50% have uh, integers. So it will just tell you this when you do a describe table or describe schema or whatever your equivalent is. And then you actually know what the schema is of your database at this time. Am I, am I making sense? So it's not a schema-free system or a schema-less system. It is a schema system. If you're not doing any writes, this is what you are going to see your schema because your data is fixed. But if you add more data with different types, your schema might change because you'd have more fields in your table. So if, this if is I, what I mean by... What, what do I, so what do I get when I do select star in this example? Because like the first document has, has city, the second one doesn't have city. Should I, should I get back city and then it's null for document two or like? Great question, yeah. So take for example, um, so the, our result set is obviously a set of JSONs that you're getting, right? But if you're looking at a particular document and you have a where clause, let's say select star where age is greater than 30. 
right? So now our system will automatically know that looking at integers because you're doing a type compare using SQL types. So this is specified in SQL statement. So what will happen is that it will ignore um, records where the type, there's a type mismatch. If you also want to do the type, then you can do the type of command in SQL. And then you can also do a type of where clause saying, find me all records with a type of age is string and blah, blah, blah. So basically, my question is like, the, like for, the, for, the, for the projection list, like select star, do I get back, like, yes. like do, so I, do I get back city, but for the second document city set the null? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So SQL null is what you'll get. If you're doing a SQL query, if you're using a JSON API, you'll get a JSON now because we'll assume that, okay, it's not there. What percentage, yeah. you, what percentage of your current customers use JSON versus SQL? Uh, most of people use SQL right now, but we also have a feature called Query Lambdas, which basically people can put a SQL inside a REST API because mm -hmm. a lot of their developers don't know SQL. So the SQL developer will go to query Lambda and create a SQL and say, okay, this is how I expose it to my developers. And then those guys, so that will part of the query Lambda and I can explain you actually with an example, mm -hmm. uh, which is also quite a popular feature for Rockset. Mm. But, um, but yeah, so there's always this complexity or people, very, it's very easy to confuse SQL now with JSON now because they're completely different. Uh, so we have like a good, description about why, who should use what. Uh, so I have a, a small question, if you don't mind. Uh, my name is Ling. Uh, I'm a PhD student here working on databases. So, so I'm wondering for this table, this summarization you are showing on the right bottom corner, is mm -hmm. this a actual table you are storing? Are you actually no. maintaining this thing or is this it materialized? This is materialized. So what we do is that we actually make a SQL query to all the leaf nodes. Like uh -huh. let's say there are 100 nodes in your cluster, it will make a query to all the leaf nodes and assemble the, um, the schema. It's just like any other query. Okay, so this is actually a materialized view you are maintaining. It's not a materialized view, but it is a view that you get by looking at, okay, so let me put it this way. There are counters and type counters that are maintained on every leaf node. Okay. So when we need to say describe table, then it makes a query to all the leaf nodes and gets this materialized or the counters from these systems and then shows you the assorted value at the end. I see, makes sense, got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's there. Uh, so this is what I meant by saying that uh, we want we do schema binding at query time. So it's a very SQL uh, API that we have. It's completely ANSI SQL. We have joins, aggregation, sorts, and everything else. Uh, and we also have all the SQL types. So take for example, if you're doing a JSON time, uh, we can have like the eight different SQL date time var varieties or variants that are out there, most of the SQL language. Uh, and you can make pure SQL queries on those. That sounds terrible. I know. I mean, I wish the SQL yeah. language was a little bit different, but I mean, that's what we have now. So, <laughs> and, p and you'd be surprised that people actually use all these variants. So, uh, <clears throat> so that's one. So the second one uh, is that uh, challenges with smart schemas. Does it need, people usually complain, at least database people, uh, they say, oh, this is going to eat a lot of CPU because we have to do lots of indexing, we have to do this, we have to do that. And also increase a lot of disk space to store types because we associate a type with every field or every, every value inside the column and not just the column, right? Uh, these are standard questions I mostly get, that's why I put it in here. Um, so the first one is, if you look at this example, the top one is the relational database. So if you have a schema and then you have a data store, the schema is stored separately from the data store, right? So let's say the city is a string. It's stored in one place in a relational database somewhere. And then all your data is on like the tightly formatted columns or files inside on your data. Uh, in the second example is JSON where the type comes with every field, right? If you have an int, it will say age colon 31. That's the, by looking at it, by looking at the JSON spec, now you know that this is an int, which basically means there's a schema with every value um, in your JSON. Uh, and there's a purple line below each of these. So that's the amount of storage that we actually use. Take for example, relational, the, the purple line is very efficient. 
if you store JSON, your purple line is very big because you're basically storing a schema at every field in your JSON. Uh, what Rockset does is simple things like field inter internal. So if your data is similar types, it basically stores the type somewhere else, just like a relational database. Um, and so the purple line is somewhere in between a tightly packed relational database versus a very loosely coupled JSON storage system where you need to actually store the schema at every field. Um, I don't know whether I'm able to explain the last thing there. Is all I'm trying to say is that for uh, if you store data which is of similar types, then the overhead more or less comes close to relational database tables. Only when you store lots of mixed types, like the same field has 50% integers and 50% strings and 50 or 25% strings, 25% integers, 25% objects, and they're kind of mixed and in, intertwined, then the overhead might be slightly more for Rockset compared to a traditional database. But that's the cost of doing business with JSON or semi-structured data. Mm, that's as far as the space store is concerned. Now, as far as CPU is concerned, again, on the left, I gave you some relative examples, like strict schema, let's say I use this much CPU to run a query. On completely JSON data, I need probably double at least, at least some of our measurements. But for our smart schemas, we definitely use it slightly more than traditional relational tables where uh, the schema is uh, kind of extrapolated out. But we come close to where relational tables are. And what we do on the right side is that, uh, again, relational tables mostly store uh, similar size um, values in a, like a, in a factor order or some good order so that you don't have to store the type. Whereas in schema less, the types and the values are kind of inter intertwined or intermixed or interleaved. For Rockset, we do this type hoisting where we hoist a type. If all the types are same, we actually hoist a type to the beginning and essentially we don't have uh, in much overhead if lots of the types are the same, lots of the values are of the same type. So this is basically, all I'm trying to say is that efficient engineering can reduce the cost of these semi-structured data formats, uh, especially if most of the data is anyway of the same type and only like say 1% of the data is uh, something else. <clears throat> uh, the last thing that I wanted to cover is a little bit about cloud economics and how we do uh, cloud storage or how we efficiently leverage the cloud. So the focus again is that uh, on the cloud, uh, renting one CPU for 100 minutes is the same price as renting 100 CPU for one minute. So this is uh, kind of one of the reasons why uh, whatever Rockset does all this while, all the things that I explained is usable right now because uh, with the cloud, we don't provision for peak capacity. We just provision for current demand and we have a disaggregated architecture. So all these reasons play a part why indexing is possible now versus 10 years back. Because 10 years back, if you try to do indexing, you have to buy a lot of hardware to be able to provision for peak capacity. And I'll, I will tell you how we try to scale up and scale down uh, when data changes. Uh, so, <clears throat> so again, our vision is that if a query is slow, it's because the software is not good enough. If, if I can spin up 100 CPUs, I would rather do that and make your query complete immediately rather than uh, trying to complete that query in 100 minutes. Because again, the cost of the hardware is the same. The challenge is all in the software. And so that makes us feel really ex uh, like excited because I think, I mean, we are, our team is good in software versus building new hardware platforms and setting up racks and those things. So this one, what we do is that, how does Rockset actually leverage the cloud architecture? So one thing that we mentioned earlier is the CQRS pattern where when data comes in, the tailors are the guys who are extracting the data and getting it into say serialized, par small parts for each serialized fields. Uh, and so if there's a lot of volume of data, we definitely scale up all the tailors, which is pure CPU. And so it's easier to scale them up. No provisioning needed. So based on um, some auto scaling policies that you have based on AWS auto scaling and Kubernetes auto scaling, we scale up these tailors when needed. Uh, similarly, leaf nodes, when there's more data to be stored, we scale up the leaf nodes very fast to be able to replicate and copy. And I'm going to explain how we do that. That's a little bit challenging. And then the aggregators, again, you don't have a provision for peak capacity. When queries come in, we try to spin up more aggregators when there's more CPU that you need to be able to keep your query latencies. 
So I'm going to focus on scaling of the leads because that's the stateful part. And that's where it's usually difficult compared to the stateless parts to scale up and scale down. <clears throat> so what do we do? Uh, we use S3, obviously. So uh, our claim is that shared storage is back in action and shared storage is cloud storage. So how can I leverage the cloud share? By the way, David Dewitt was my prof when I was at Wisconsin. So I used to have very exciting <laughs> discussions with him at that time. But this, was, this is much newer. Uh, so he's, he's also claimed that, hey, the end of share nothing is here. Um, so how does Rock, uh, Rockset leverage the cloud? So here, the same picture of the alt architecture in a slightly different fashion just to show where the things are. So the green things are the leaves, which is where the data is. And they use something called open source RocksDB Cloud. So RocksDB Cloud, what it does, it is basically a layer on top of RocksDB. So every time new SSD files get produced, they actually push the SSD files to cloud storage. So that's the only extension of RocksDB Cloud versus RocksDB, right? So this is another part that Rocks had open sourced, is the RocksDB Cloud uh, uh, open source software. So what it does is that when, tail, when data comes in, it comes in from the tailors and gets distributed to the leaf and they get indexed, they get compacted by RocksDB and then get pushed to S3 or equivalent GCS. Now, um, what we have done is that we have separated durability from performance. So durability is from S3. So we will never have data loss. I mean, our data loss prob probability is as low or as high as whatever S3 is, which is probably like, 29 or some, some ungodly number. So essentially we have guaranteed that you always get durability because we store data in S3. Now, how do you get performance? We have used something called zero copy clones of RocksDB Cloud. So let's say there are three replicas serving the same data. Now the, it's getting highly loaded and we need to create new replicas. We don't do peer to peer replication. We create a new RocksDB Cloud instance. It has a feature called zero copy clone. What it does, it takes the SSD files from an existing uh, leaf shard, starts filling it in, uh, and then starts tailing new data that the tailors is generating or new updates, and then uh, becomes part of the query processing and the queries through the aggregators start coming to the new leaf process. So basically, all I'm trying to say is that in this shared storage architecture, there is not no peer-to-peer -peer replication or copying. We use cloud storage to do this replication. And we have separated durability from performance, which is another reason why we can be far more efficient than say Elasticsearch or some other Cassandra that you might be running three replicas just for durability, although nobody's querying your data. Uh, <clears throat> so if nobody's querying this data, then you can afford to run it one replica, for example. And again, replica essentially is SSD, RAM and CPU, which is where the cost of your database usually is. Uh, so that's one. <clears throat> and then we also do something called so remote. The, 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 real quick, the RocksDB cloud is what? It's a, it's a hacked up version of RocksDB or is it a standalone it's, library that speaks the RocksDB cloud? Library. Yeah, RocksDB cloud is also a library. So RocksDB already has pluggable ways to extend everything. So that's the whole point of RocksDB. So RocksDB cloud has extended the RocksDB env. RocksDB has something called an env environment. Uh -huh. So RocksDB Cloud provides a cloud environment when running RocksDB, which lets you do this automatically. So the API is exactly like RocksDB. Your application doesn't have to change. Uh, but all the thing is the feature that it gets is that even if your machine dies, you can get all the data back because the data is actually nested. And then for the RocksDB that Rockset runs, is that, are you guys maintaining your own fork or is it just RocksDB off the shelf? So we actually run RocksDB Cloud, which is the source code that we have open sourced. Okay. And it is in lockstep with RocksDB because we work closely with the RocksDB team. Uh, and what it does is basically RocksDB has pluggable APIs and RocksDB Cloud specifies those APIs to run well on S3 or GCS or any other cloud storage system. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, but, but RocksDB Cloud is a wrapper around RocksDB. My question is for RocksDB, like the core you know, database storage engine, are you running the open source version or does RocksDB, Rock, does Rockset have a hacked up version or fork that you guys maintain that's separate? No, it's the open source RocksDB that we okay. run. Okay. Yeah, but we have RocksDB Cloud, which kind of wraps yeah, the open right. source RocksDB and gives us more power. Right, I understand that part. Okay, good. Oh, we have about four oh. or five minutes left. Sure. 
Any other questions here? Uh, hi, this is Steven from Yale. I have a question. Since S3 is eventually consistent, where in order to do a strong consistent reads, uh, where are you storing the, um, the S3 keys in your system? Good question, yeah. Huh. Uh, so what happens is that, um, so let's say uh, in this picture, let's, let's say the rightmost leaf has written some S3 file, right? Now when you need to create a leaf, when you need to create a replica, uh, we have to read the same S3 files into in the new replica. So what happens is that uh, that S3, so RocksDB has something called a manifest inside the database. So the replica actually reads the manifest and finds what S3 files need is part of the database, right? And the replica, if it doesn't find an S3, it knows that it is coming. So it retries and gets it. So basically what I'm trying to say is that RocksDB metadata tells us what S3 key is to look at. Um, and if it is not there yet, then we wait for one or two seconds and with a retry look to make sure that we can get it. <clears throat> Uh, so that's there. So now we also, in RocksDB, we also have something called remote compaction. Now this picture is not very clear because this just got shipped like two, three weeks back. Uh, so compaction is a big problem in general, like LSM system. Problem in the sense it has to be tuned. So um, compaction typically runs on RocksDB itself, right? On the node which is running RocksDB. So what we have done is we have implemented something called remote compaction. Again, to separate compute from storage. So uh, the server is actually writing new SSD files. And when it is time to compact, it makes an RPC to a compaction tier and says that, hey, compact me these three S3 files and give me the results. Uh, because everything is against shared storage. So we are banking heavily on shared storage architectures on the cloud. And we are saying that we can dissociate compute from storage by being able to do things like remote compaction. We have a blog there which gives you at least better explanation compared to the pictures that I have here. <clears throat> um, so that's that's another way how we can kind of separate the write compute, read compute, and the storage completely independent of one another. Uh, so again, just to recap before I take questions, is that there's no need to manage indexes with converged indexing, so no create index command, and no need to define schemas, uh, which basically means you can do a describe table and it will show you the schema just like a pure SQL system does. And you don't have to provision servers because uh, storage is going to keep adding more pods as and when you deposit more data. So just a summary from an engineering perspective is that what is different in Rockset? So the philosophy of Rockset is that we, we are claiming that our database can la run large data sets and we index and scan or partition and index ver versus doing partition and scan. So most traditional big data systems, including Hadoop, MapReduce, and everything else that followed, is all about partitioning and scanning. That's how most of the big data systems run, even bigger warehouses. For us, we are claiming that we can actually partition and index. So this is uh, one of the big bets that Rockset is taking and saying that partition and index is actually gives you better query latencies on large data sets. So that's the first point. The second point is that we definitely want to separate write compute from query compute. This is also um, not that many databases do this very well, but prove me wrong, maybe I'm not, I might not be knowing some newer ones that people are building. Um, so how can you make sure that write compute is very different from query compute uh, so that they don't interact with one another? And then the focus of doing the first two is to see how we can do get again low data latency, low query latency, and high QPS on these systems. So that's kind of the first two are basically the engineering architectural differences compared to previous generation data systems that I have played around with. Uh, but I'd like to hear your opinions and questions or anything else. Okay, awesome. Uh, so. Again, because we're not in a, in, a, in a physical space, I will clap on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so we have time for a few questions if anybody wants to fire one, fire one at Drew. Uh, hi, this is Panos Chrysanthes. I'm a professor at uh, uh, Pitt. And uh, my, I have two questions. The first one is uh, related to the last part that you said 
uh, basically somehow your model is shifting the trade off from uh, one part of the pipeline of uh, or ingesting and querying to the other part. And I felt that maybe a sort of a bottleneck was actually this uh, atomic right. Is that true? And uh, somehow, is that uh, something that you try to overcome in some respect? Uh, that's a good question. I think, uh, I think, are you talking about this picture in general? Yeah, the one that you basically you try to write all the documents into the same site so to avoid two-phase okay. commit or fax source you try, that it seems to be the first big bottleneck that uh, you have to deal with with this new shifting great question great question yeah so i think uh, the way i look at it is that um if you look at a traditional database like i was very closely associated with hbase so i can speak for it uh, but most systems, what they do is that when a query comes in, the focus of the database is that how can I make sure that I use my system efficiently to be able to give you query results, right? Let's say that two queries come in, they try to do a timeshare or whatever and try to make sure that I can use all the hardware to give you good latencies on those two queries. Mm -hmm. So whereas for Rockset, the focus is that it's more like a search database. So what it means is that the focus is always first on latency and it's only second focus is efficiency and the third focus is throughput so the first one is always about query latency so this is why it is like a search database so what it means is that um, when a query comes in the query now has to make rpcs to let's say 100 machines because the 100 machines in your index uh, so there is a cost of cpu to making 100 parallel rpcs to 100 different machines Traditional databases try to optimize this by saying that I'm going to put all my data on two machines because I know how to partition this data, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make those two RPCs and get my results back. Whereas for Rockset, it is possible that we actually spend more CPU as part of this query processing because now it has to fan out to 100 machines if there's 100 machines in your cluster. But the advantage is that very complex SQL logic now is spread out among 100 machines and they're working in parallel. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but, so, uh, but you have to have a appropriate query optimizer, right? I agree, I agree. But this is how, I mean, this is basically the trade-off between search databases and uh, term sharded databases, is that search databases, they are always optimized to give you the lowest latency. And if there's a complex query, our claim is that there's no other way but to spread this load among all the machines in your cluster. So how can I get 64 cores on each of these 100 machines running the SQL query in parallel on small parts of your data? That's the only way to leverage these 6,400 CPUs I might have in my cluster to, to optimize the query latency of this. See, it's not about optimizing the entire throughput of your system. If you want to optimize throughput of your system, then you might want to partition your data so that if there are 40 queries, you all the 40 queries hit two nodes at a time and give you the best results or using less CPU. Uh, am, I, am I answering your question or like? Uh, yeah, partially, yes. At an architecture level, saying that there's a trade-off and I understand your question. Yeah, and I was wondering whether you measure the trade-off or somehow to get, Yes, yes, you know, yes. You claim is better than the other. This was uh, more so, my question, actually. No, that's a great question. So what we have measured is that when there's a complex SQL query, we would like to use as many CPUs in parallel as possible on the data set. So th this is basically the, the theory there. Uh, and there's no other way if I do term partitioning, then if all my data is on one machine, then that machine becomes bottleneck, the other machines are idle and they're not able to solve the query. So, so yeah, so I mean, okay, but that's so, a good question. All right, so we have one last question from Ken Burns, go for it. Hey, so given that the SSTs are written Wait, sorry, Ken, where, where are you coming from? Sorry. I'm from California. Yeah, unaffiliated. Perfect, go for it. Given that the SSTs are written to S3 but not the write-ahead log, does that mean that the tailors are stateful or do they rely on upstream durability for log replay? Ah, excellent question. So this all depends on upstream uh, ability to tail data, right? So if I look at, if I go back to... Um, this picture maybe, for example, right? 
So the tailors, they're getting data from a source. And there are two, ex two expectations there. If the sources are, say, like Data Lake or Kafka Stream or something else, then obviously you can go back to the data source if you're not able to replay something into the database. There's also a write API. So there is also a way to actually write data to Rockset without tailing from a particular source. Like let's say you have, you have an application and you're doing writes to the database. That also writes to, uh, to Rockset without having a tailor because it's just like a plain, plain dumb write system. Uh, and so that, what that happens is that um, Rockset actually uses a distributed log inside to be able to make it durable before it hits S3. So I skipped that part just to reduce complexity. But yes, there are two assumptions. One is that if you already have data in data sources, like streams and lakes, then you don't need the durability in Rockset. But if you're using the right API to Rockset, Rockset uses a distributed log and it does three your application for the last one minute of, or five minutes of logs before it actually hits the S3 uh, storage system. Does it answer your question, Steve? Or uh, yes. Yeah. Great, yeah. thanks. Okay. Okay, awesome. Uh, so we're out of time. Again, Jabut, I thank you for spending the afternoon with us.